get up here, do some malware analysis stuff. Um, it's a hobby that I like to do. I don't do it professionally. Um, it's just something I, I really enjoy. And so I was looking. Well, that's on the next slide. <laughs> All right. All right, so my name is Craig Liebhart. I self-describe as a politics junkie, don't judge, a geek, Viking, very, very, very occasional blogger. In fact, there's nothing on my website right now, so don't go to it. And I am an aspiring cybersecurity expert. I went to school originally for political science. Um, it kind of goes into that politics part. I'm kind of a policy wonk. I really like checking out the uh, latest NIST publications. Um, and then I eventually realized that computers were kind of more my thing, so I went back to school and got a computer science degree from Drake. And right now I'm working, finally, in cybersecurity officially uh, at an insurance company here in Des Moines. All right, so I wanted to talk a little bit about why to do malware analysis. So. The obvious reason is because you get those emails with these funny attachments and you really, really, really want to know what's in there and otherwise, you know, it's not safe to do it. Um, so when I was kind of going back to school and looking at, you know, all the stuff going on and everything I was learning, you know, networking, virtualization, programming, all this different stuff, you know, I was looking for a topic that really kind of tied it all together and for me that was malware analysis. Um, because it can really touch on kind of every single different, you know, niche topic in computer science. Um, but more importantly, you know, in the work setting, if you were to actually have a malware incident, um, these are some of the questions that, um, depending on how bad the incident is, you know, the press might be asking you, maybe it'll just be your boss. Um, these are the type of things that you need to try and find answers to. Um, so why did the initial incident occur? Uh, once it occurred, how was it able to continue for so long? You know, look at Newegg, different companies, you know, it goes on sometimes weeks, months before they find it. Uh, what were the key events in the timeline? What systems exactly were impacted or compromised? And then eventually you have to prove that you fully recovered for it, from it. So you're going to have to have some sort of evidence and say, you know, yes, we identified everything from the incident. We went through and we were able to remove everything from our different systems. And so that goes how to malware kind of ties into it. Um, malware analysis, you know, a lot of people look at it and they think, you know, this is a really difficult topic. Um, they say it's got to be really, really difficult. I don't know where to start or anything like that. Um, so that's why, you know, I really kind of wanted to do this talk is to kind of present it in a way that's a little easier to grasp um, for somebody who is an amateur. So someone like myself who just kind of dabbles in malware analysis. Um, anybody can really do it, and hopefully at the end of this presentation you'll kind of see that. Um, but some different topic areas that are kind of helpful to know um, and maybe research if you're thinking about getting into it. Um, virtualization um, is really important. Most people are going to use virtualized uh, machines that they're running their malware samples on because who has time to re-image you know, physical computers every time you want to go back and see exactly what just happened. Um, networking. Because um, you want to be able to see, you know, what this malware sample is doing, what it's communicating with, how it's trying to spread. Is there a command and control server out there somewhere? Um, when you really get into trying to look at the malware code itself, it's really helpful to have a basic grasp over some higher level programming languages. Um, just so um, you don't have to be, you know, an expert programmer, but just kind of know how they work. So for loops, while loops, um, you know, calls, function calls, things like that. Um, because if you're looking at the disassembled um, binaries, you know, you're going to want to be able to kind of look in there and say, okay, yeah, I can see where this is a, a for loop, or maybe this is iterating through something, or, you know, this is a, a Boolean statement where it's saying if this or that, then do this or that. Um, so if you have those high-level understandings of how those work, because chances are that's exactly what the, the author of the malware used to write it, um, it just makes it a little easier. And I'll kind of talk about that a little more here in a second. Um, x86 assembly language, um, so that's really, really hard to do that. I don't know how many people, raise a hand, anybody do x86? I see one hand. <laughs> how, how easy is it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, so it, it's a little difficult. It's, it's not that easy. 
Um, but there are tools out there that can kind of help you in terms of disassembling and looking at that assembly language, Ida Pro, um, which I'll hopefully show you here if I don't run out of time. Um, and then the other thing that's really important to kind of know is a little bit about Windows operating systems and the Windows API. And when I say it's good to know about it, really I mean you just need to be able to Google what these different DLL libraries are and things like that. Um, so when you identify something in the code, you know, I don't expect anyone to know what this, these function calls do necessarily, but it's fairly easy to, to find them using the Microsoft Developer Network website. So before you start doing any sort of analysis, um, you really want to look at how you want to do your, your, your malware lab. Um, like I said, you could do a physical lab or you could do a virtual lab. So physical lab, you know, there are some pros to it. Um, a lot of malware is written in a way that it can tell whether or not it's running in a virtual environment or an actual physical environment. Um, and then it can maybe not execute correctly or do different things depending, uh, you know, on, on what they want to do. Um, you get to actually observe the malware on a real network. Um, that can be really, really helpful. Um, the cons, you know, as soon as you run it, Something happens, you say, oh, I want to go see that again. You have to re-image the whole machine, you know, run it all over again. Um, and then you also have to have those physical machines to run it on, because I'm not going to run it on my, you know, gaming desktop at home, because then I'd lose that. With the virtual, uh, it's a little easier to quickly restore the machines. Um, you get uh, benefits of recording and playing back sessions sometimes. So if you're looking at how the processes are changing, you know, you can have those up on the screen, you can record it, and then go back and watch the video a little easier. Um, obviously, you need less desk space if you just are running virtual machines. You don't have to have space for all those boxes. Um, some of the cons, like I said, malware sometimes knows if it's in a virtual environment. Um, and the other risk that you're always running is uh, some malware can spread from the virtual machine down to the host machine. So um, whatever you're running it on, you are essentially always taking a little bit of a risk that uh, it's a little ringing. And then the other question is whether or not you should air gap. Um, so obviously I hope this goes without saying, but you should never really run computer viruses in a production environment. Um, you should take it off your network, whether it's at work or at home, um, and run it. Um, if at all possible, you want to kind of simulate internet access. Um, that's the safest and best way to do that, and I'll kind of touch on that a little and show you, you know, some ways you can do that. Um, otherwise, if you're going to do it, use protection. Um, basically, what I'm saying there is, like I said, you, you won't want to necessarily be on your, your normal network. So, like, if you have a hotspot, you could set up on your phone. I've done that before where I'm using the hotspot so it's not on my home network. But then always put it behind a VPN or a Tor socket or something like that so that, you know, the, the people you're investigating can't tra trace back and see you know, who you are. You don't want to paint a target on yourself or anything like that. Okay, so real quick, before I move on to that, I just thought I would mention some resources that I found really, really helpful. So if this is something you're looking to get into, um, some of these books are kind of old now, but they're still really, really good. So this is the best one, um, Practical Malware Analysis. Um, I really, really like this book. Um, and then the second one, Malware Analyst Cookbook. Um, this one is really good for, especially if you have a, a funny situation that you're just trying to figure out how to do. You can kind of look in here and find examples of where they've done you know, different things. Uh, but for learning especially, this one is really, really good. I highly recommend it. OK. Any questions so far? All right. So when you're doing your analysis, there's two different ways to do it. There's static and dynamic, and you're going to want to try and use a combination of the two. Um, usually, you kind of start with the easier static steps, um, then you do kind of easier dynamic steps, and then you move from there into the more advanced stuff. So for basic static, essentially what you're going to do um, is you're going to take your executable, and you're going to look at the file details. Um, so you're going to look in the file header. Um, you never actually really look at the code at this point. And then from there, you move into the basic dynamic. Um, so basically, you're going to run the computer virus on you know, a host machine. And you're going to kind of look at some of the stuff that's happening. 
um, but you're not going to be doing any like debugging or anything like that. So you're going to kind of look at registry changes, processes that are starting or stopping. Um, you're going to be looking for any of the network communication, see what IP addresses it's trying to communicate with. Then you move into the advanced static, which is disassembling the binary and trying to reverse engineer the code itself. And after that, um, you can do the dynamic analysis um, of running it through a, a debugger like Oli, uh, Oli Debug or WinDebug. And so real quick, I wanted to touch on a few uh, tools that I use that are free. So you shouldn't have to, to pay money for any of these. And I was telling Michael, I vetted these the other night just to make sure that they're all still there. They still look like they're free. They don't look like, you know, Russians have taken it and, you know, replaced the website with something fishy or anything like that. So these should all still be safe. Um, and these are going to be in alphabetical order. Uh, so a pet ID and S, um, this was created by Mandiant before Mandiant was purchased by FireEye. Um, essentially what it can do is it can grab uh, the network DNS traffic, and you can use it to redirect to somewhere else. Uh, dependency Walker uh, walks through and identifies the DLLs um, and any functions that are imported or exported. Ida Pro, um, so there's the, the paid version, which costs thousands and thousands of dollars, or there's the free version, which is a few steps behind, uh, but still works just as fine. Um, basically, it's a disassembler, lets you look at the, the the assembly language code. INET SIM is a free tool that you can run on a Linux box, um, and you can use this to simulate uh, the, the web interaction. So when you don't want to have it connected to the live internet, you can run INET SIM and configure it um, to do things like respond to get requests, um, respond to FTP requests, different things like that. Um, not all versions of Windows have really easy to use hashing uh, built in. Um, CertUtil can do some, um, PowerShell can do some, but MD5Deep sometimes is a little easier. Um, you can get that from GitHub, basically just as file hashing. Uh, Netcat, you can use that to you know, watch um, network traffic. Um, easiest way to get that I found is to get the, the bundle with um, Nmap. Only debug is a good debugger. PE browse lets you look at the PE file headers and does some other things with the, the imports and the exports. PEID um, is a compiler. Um, sorry, you can use it to identify. So a lot of times uh, programs, both good and bad programs, um, you don't want this big, giant, huge file. So they'll do what's called packing it, which is kind of like zipping it or encrypting it, making it smaller. Um, but uh, people that write malware really like to use it to kind of try to hide what it's doing to make it more difficult for you to look at it and figure out you know, what it is that they're up to. Um, so you can use this to identify what it's compiled with if, or what it's packed with if something is packed. Um, and then you can unpack it so that you can actually look at it. PE view, um, looking at file headers again. Process Explorer, so this is a sys internals tool. Um, lets you look at the uh, processes that are running a little easier. Proc process Monitor, sometimes called Procmon, um, is also look good for looking at the uh, uh, process changes, file system changes, things like that. Registshot, um, so this is a really cool tool. It lets you take a snapshot of the registry before and after you run the virus to see what sort of things are happening. Uh, resource Hacker uh, lets you look at the resource section of the file. Um, and so sometimes that can be anything from icons or it could be uh, menu interfaces. Another cool thing is sometimes people will hide things like drivers inside the resource section. Um, so you could use this to extract a driver. Um, good old strings. Hopefully everybody knows what that is, but basically it just pulls all the strings out of a file. Uh, Wind debug. So this one actually, there is no wind debug anymore. Now it's called wind debug preview. So Microsoft has made some changes. I, as far as I can tell, you can't actually download wind debug anymore, um, but you can uh, download wind debug preview, uh, but it only runs on Windows 10, as far as I can tell. 
Wireshark, obviously good for capturing your network traffic. Uh, hybrid analysis or other websites uh, like malware, which is down right now, M-A-L-W-R, um, different places where essentially um, you can get samples, but then also upload the samples and try to see um, what sort of research and stuff has been done already. Um, that goes back into, like I said, where to get the samples. So I used to use malware.com. I really, really liked it. It was really simple to use. Um, it's down right now. It's coming back soon. Um, otherwise, hybrid analysis is good, um, except I found when I just tried to use it again recently that they have to vet you before they let you actually download any of these samples. So I'm still actually still being vetted, so I can't use this. Um, so I found um, another site. So Lenny Zeltzer, if I said that right. Uh, yeah, here we are. So Zeltzer has on his blog a huge list of a bunch of really great places where you can go and try to find malware samples to use for your research and for learning. I guess I have that slide in there twice. So dasmalwork.eu, that's actually where I got one of the samples we're going to look at here today. Um, the other option is you could just go through, like I said earlier, your junk mail, see what sort of fun stuff people have sent you. Um, if you really wanted to get fancy, you could set up a honeypot or something like that. All right, so at this point, I'm going to jump into actually showing you guys some of these tools, doing some little demos and things like that. Um, are there any questions before I start with that? I plan on eventually putting these slides on my website that I never update. Um, when I do, I'll announce it in Slack. So you guys, if you want that list of tools, you can go and get it. All right, so basic static analysis. Well, actually, hold on, let's back up. Let's talk about um, your environments first. So the way I usually do it is I do uh, a virtual environment. Um, so the only paid program that I use um, that I really like just because I found it really easy to use um, is uh, VMware Desktop. Um, you can also use uh, VirtualBox, and I think VMware still offers a free version as well. Um, I'm a couple versions behind, but I've just always found it a little nicer to have the professional version. I don't even remember what I paid for it, but I'm poor, so it wasn't that much. Um, but it's pretty nice. So basically, um, once you have an ISO, you can just plug it in here, start up your computer. You do have to have um, keys for like Windows, for example. Um, and I'll be honest, this Windows 7 key that I found, I just Googled it and I just found one and kept trying them until it worked because who has Windows 7 keys lying around anymore? <laughs> um, otherwise, Ubuntu is obviously free, um, but it's really nice. You can do snapshots, different things like that. Um, so just for example, if we look at this one, at the snapshot manager, you can see the different snapshots I've taken. So I was looking at a suspicious email the other day. Um, this is my starting point for our presentation here today. Um, and it's always really good to have one good starting snapshot of your base machine before you've really done anything. Um, so that's what this clean VM is. Um, that is my snapshot after I installed it, did all the updates, but before I even installed any of my malware tools or anything. That way you always have a good base point to come back to and you're not having to you know, completely reinstall the, the VM or anything like that. Um, that's really nice, that's really easy. And then the other thing, I'll just show you how to do it here on the VMware. But so in settings, this is where you can set your network stuff. So right now I have this on a, a custom specific virtual network. So this is just a, a local virtual network. So nothing is on this virtual network except uh, the virtual machine that I'm running. Um, there are other options. So you can bridge it. Um, you can use a NAT. Um, so if you did have to give access to the live internet, that's how you would do it. Otherwise, I recommend until you need to actually connect it to the internet, um, you just put it on its own virtual network 
uh, by itself with nothing else. Um, that way you know it's not wreaking havoc, you know, anywhere. But like I said, you shouldn't be connected to, you know, your production network or your home network when you're running the malware anyway. But Okay, so basic static analysis. This is, these are the steps that I really recommend, and this is the steps that I usually always try to go for, go through. Um, so the very first thing I do is I try to get a file hash, um, and then I run it through uh, virus total, or why am I using that mouse? I've got a mouse plugged in. All right, so this is our sample here. It's zipped right now, so we need to unzip it. You'll find that most samples that you find online come in a zipped folder. Usually the password is infected. That's kind of the industry standard. And then usually they don't have the file type on the end of it, um, just to try and protect you from being dumb and, and clicking on it. So you have to go in there and change it to something. I usually like to do sample dot exe, obviously, if it's an executable. And then to run strings, it's a command line program through sys internals. Well, can people see that? I know it's a little, might be a little small. And I don't know if many people are aware of the n option on strings, but it's actually really nice. So basically, you can specify how many characters you want. So that removes a lot of the garbage that sometimes you can get. Um, a lot of times, I start at 10. Um, I go up or down, depending on how much noise I seem to be getting. Um, so in this case, we're going to get 10 characters wide. And just because the command line of Windows 7 is a real pain, we'll output this into a And actually, I just realized we're supposed to be getting the file hash, not a, a string. So we'll do that too while we're in here. So we'll do SHA-256 deep64.exe. And we'll put that into SHA-256. All right, so there's our SHA. And we're not connected to the internet. So one of the other nice things about having a virtual desktop is you can actually real easily drag and drop. This file over here where we've got the internet. And especially when you're learning, I really recommend doing this and looking in VirusTotal and just seeing what other people have found already. Because when you're learning, you know, this will kind of help you give you some pointers what to kind of look for. I mean, if you really want a challenge, I suppose you could you know, do all your analysis first and then come back and do it. Um, but, you know, why, you know, rob yourself of that when you're, when you're just learning? So you can come in here, you can see very clearly, obviously, you know, this is malicious. Um, you can look and get some examples of kind of what people think it is. So this looks like it's probably has some key logging in it. Um, if you look in here, you can look at, you know, when it was first seen, when it was the last time it was seen. Um, file names, um, gives you some of the DLLs, a bunch of nice 
metadata to just kind of give you a, a starting point of some things to maybe look for as you're looking at it. So then back in our virtual machine. Yeah, how do you do that? Yeah, there we are. Is it? Yeah, I thought I looked for this before. Cursor size. Yeah, they've made a lot of improvements in Windows. I don't know if anybody's noticed that. <laughs> <laughs> if, if only all these old tools, you know, worked just as well. That's the only problem with a lot of these tools is, you know, they're fairly old and they've worked, so people haven't gone back and had to update them yet because, you know, you still have Windows 7. It's not like Windows XP, which is gone now. Um, but anyway, so let's try to get back to my presentation here. Okay, so we got the file hash. We looked at virus total. We confirmed it's malicious. Um, all right, so next thing I was saying that we should do is look at PEID. So if you come in here, I have that in my documents. Make it bigger so you can see it a little better. So PEID. Um, so it's just a little, a little GUI, and you say, I want to open, and we'll do the samples. All right, so this tells you a little bit of thing. It tries to figure out where the entry point is for the code. Um, it also tries to identify if it's packed or not, um, which would be right here. And so this is trying to tell us that it does not think that it's packed, at least per this tool. Um, I'll tell you once we get a little later, um, that's actually not entirely correct. But if we look at this other sample, for example, we'll call it something different. That's the actual name that, of the file. So on this example, you can actually see, so right here, UPX, that's the name of the packer. Um, that this malware author used for this one. Um, so generally speaking, if you see that something is packed, uh, basically what that's telling is you can't really do any static analysis usually until you figure out a way to unpack it. Um, you won't be able to gain much. Sometimes you can gain a little, um, but it's really hard to gain much. So since we've got it, let's do this, look at the strings real fast for that first one that we just did. And I'm going to bring this out of here where it'll be a little easier. So my recommendation for doing this, I hope it didn't give us any strings. Just go ahead and I'll run it in here. So that works. I mean, should have been able to do strings or txt. And let's try that again. All right, there we go. So there's all of our strings. And so what I kind of recommend for this, because there's a lot of stuff in here. Some of it is good. Some of it's garbage. So there's a bunch of garbage. Um, what I like to do is take this file. And I like to put it in Microsoft Excel. And then I basically sort it alphabetically. And basically what you're doing is you're just looking for anything that stands out as really interesting. 
Um, so there's a bunch of garbage. Um, everything says it doesn't run in DOS mode, because why would it? Um, so you get down and you start running into some fun things eventually, and I think. All right, there. So now we're starting to see some interesting things. So these look like uh, Windows API functions. Um, and if you kind of look through here, I have a cheat sheet. I went through this so we don't have to actually go through it all together. But I'll just tell you some of the fun ones and notable ones that I found in there. Let's see. All right, so. All right, so some of the things that I found when I was looking through here, there was attach thread input, um, which is basically used by a lot of key loggers and spyware um, to look at things like keyboard and mouse events. Um, there's is debugger present, which by itself doesn't tell you a whole lot, but is a lot of times used in conjunction with anti-debugging steps. Um, create file, so we know that it writes to or reads from a file. Um, it creates some processes. Um, we've got internet open, so we know that at some point this thing opens up internet connections to something. Um, let's see. What else did we have? Uh, output debug string. Um, so it's another to, uh, library function that's called a lot of times with anti-debugging stuff. Um, so that with the other debugging function kind of tells you that there might be some debugging. Um, resume thread, so that kind of indicates that at some point it pauses a thread um, and it might be doing some injection or something in threads somewhere along the line. Uh, let's see, map virtual key. That's another big key logging one. Um, virtual keys are essentially what the, you know, the, the, virt the, the Windows understands the key as this code, and then we understand it as maybe a W or an L. Um, so that converts back and forth between you know, what Windows considers the key that you press and what it actually is, what we understand it to be. Um, used a lot by key loggers. Um, and a lot of fun different things in here. And so usually what I recommend, um, if you have this book, there's a great appendix at the back where he points out a lot of the ones that are typically used by malicious programs. Um, Otherwise, MSDN. Is the best way um, and it takes a little while. It's a little painstaking because you'll see something you don't know what it is. So you have to go on here and search for it and try to read what it is. Um, but doing this from the strings early gives you a lot of things to kind of look for later on as you're doing the more advanced stuff. Um, and then the other thing that's really nice about strings, other than kind of giving you a preview of the different um, API functions and things like that, is sometimes you can find um, IP addresses, URLs, um, different things like that to give you a jump start on, um, you know, if you were in a, a response mode, you could take those IP addresses and plug them into your, your proxy firewall or different things like that. You can use them as network-based signatures to try and identify, you know, how far spread the, the virus is. And that's before we've even really gotten any farther than strings. Um, so I'll show you real fast, PEID next. So this is gonna be looking at the file header. Whew, this is taking longer than I thought it would. All right, I'll try to speed this up a little. So PEID, let's see, we already did PEID. Uh, okay, strings, uh, basic static analysis. That's what we get into looking at the PE files and a little more closer. Um, so when you're doing your PE header analysis, some of the sections you're gonna wanna look at are the text, our data, data, and the resource sections. Um, so just to kind of give you an idea, text usually has the executable code itself. Um, our data is gonna be anything that's globally accessible to the program. Um, data is also going to be global data. Um, sometimes there's an iData, um, which has import functions. If it's not there, then it's going to be in the R data. Um, there's an eData sometimes for export functions. Otherwise, that's also in R data. Um, resources is going to be just different resources used by the 
by the malware. And you can look at some of those through fun things like uh, PE Browse, for example. This is the other painful thing about having clean snapshots that you're always working with is sometimes you have to keep reinstalling things. But P browse, and so I've got it. And this is a little small, I apologize about that. But if you just open the file you were looking at. Uh, what do we call it, samples. And I wish I could make this bigger, but in here, no, that's not the one I wanted actually, sorry. PE view, that's the better one. All right, so in PE view, DOS headers, everything has DOS headers, basically ignore it. Um, NT headers, what you're looking for here is you can see a signature, otherwise file header is the important thing. Man, I wish I could make that bigger for you. Uh, so the important thing on here is you're looking at the, the data size, or sorry, this is timestamp. Um, optional headers, this is where you're gonna get the file sizes. Um, so you wanna look at things like size of the code versus the size when it's running, and if they're different, then that gives you an indicator that it might be packed. Um, so like this one, for example, virtual size compared to size of the raw data, you can't see that, but it's different. Um, so that kind of indicates that this might be packed a little. Um, same with these ones. Let's see. Um, next thing you can do is look at dependency walker. I'll try and do that real fast because I know I'm running out of time. So if you run depends, it's really cool. It walks through the code. It's also really small for some reason. We can do the server one this time. And this basically, what this does is it goes through the code and tries to pick out for you all the DLLs, um, the dynamic link libraries that it's using. Um, and then it looks at up here are gonna be the imported functions, down here are gonna be exported functions. Um, here in the middle um, is gonna be version info about the DLLs. Um, and if there's any errors down here in the bottom, um, those are errors that you're likely to see actually running the code as well. Um, but you can look through here and see different things. A lot of these you'll recognize from looking at strings. Um, so you can see exactly where those string values were coming from. All right. Um, you can use the resource hacker. Um, I'm not gonna show you that because I wanna kinda skip on to more interesting things, but if there was interesting stuff in the resource section of that header, um, this is where you'd wanna look at it. Like I mentioned, you might have a driver in there, different things. Um, so basic dynamic analysis. Um, that's what you kind of move into next. Um, so this is where you essentially simulate network traffic. Um, I'm not gonna actually pull it up because I think there are other more interesting things I can show you, but I was gonna show you. So INET SIM is really, really easy to set up. Basically you install it and then there's a uh, comp file and you go into the comp file and you basically say, okay, I want you to imitate X, Y, and Z services. Um, I want you to have these ports open, listen on this IP address. Um, you can set um, like HTML files, so if you know the malware is expecting to get HTML back, you can actually say, okay, here's the file I want you to return when it asks for it. Um, different really cool stuff. It's really actually pretty easy to work with. Um, like I said, you just run that on um, any Ubuntu or uh, Linux box. How am I on time? All right, so basic dynamics. This is where we get into kind of the fun stuff. Um, so running procmon, looking at the changes. We'll do that because it's fun. Let's see. We'll go ahead and. 
All right, so I'm not on the internet. It's always good to double check that before you do any of the dynamic analysis. Just double check every time. Highly recommend that. Um, so you don't want to be connected to anything. But basically, so for Procmon, essentially what you do is you start running it. And immediately it likes to try and just, you know, get ahead and start going for you. Obviously you're not ready yet, because I'm not ready. Um, so you're going to want to stop it, which is that little icon there. And then you're going to want to clear the display you've got. Uh, but basically, so you're ready to start it. You go ahead and start capture. There's a hot key you can do through file. And there it is. It's starting to grab everything. Um, so we'll do, oh, what the heck, let's do this one. All right, so I just ran my, my virus. It's thinking. It's probably doing stuff. Um, and basically, for Procmon, you're just going to want to kind of sit for a little while and just kind of wait and see. So I'm going to give it just a little while. And sometimes you can kind of double these up. Um, so I could have done a red shot now, um, you know, before I executed it. And then after I stop it, I could do my second red shot and look at the registry changes. How right now, that would have been probably smarter for me to do because then I could save a little time. Uh, but basically now, so we're going to go ahead and stop capturing. And I'm going to save this in the native format. And we'll just put it on the desktop. And now we will pull that out of there. All right, so there's my log file. Drag it out of my VM. We'll stop it because we don't want just to leave the virus running when you don't need to. And let's restore back to my clean state. All right, drag it back into my virtual machine. So now in Procmon, can open that up again. Maybe, just thinking about it. And you have to stop it again. Clear the display and then I'll open my log file. So this is basically going to be a history of everything that was happening while we were running that. Um, and you can filter it. So the one we ran was called server.exe. So I'll add and I'll say, show me only the stuff with that process name. And if I apply that, so there were filtered down to it. So now you can look at everything. So you got process starts, create files. You can see the reg registry keys. Um, there are quick links up here to hide different things. So if you didn't want to see registry changes, you can do that. Um, and you can look here you know, at the different paths that it's interacting with. So if you see it create a file somewhere um, on the file path here, then you know that you can go and grab that and start looking at that also. Um, yeah, really cool, really easy, free from sys internals. Um, highly recommend using it because it's just it's really easy. Um, there you can see that this one has right there extreme rat. So now we have a, a lead on what type of, of you know, program and tool this came out of. Um, yeah, so really neat. I'll show you real fast the 40 seconds. Oh, 40, okay, 40 minutes, okay. I'll show you this one again real fast. This is the Process Explorer. It's going to be a little different. Um, extract here, infected. All right, so on this one, this is one of the ones where it comes into handy sometimes to be able to record and play back what's going on. Um, so you're seeing active live changes right now. 
um, in the processes. And when you start this, you see it pops in down here. And it went really quick, but you might have noticed there is a Firefox process running now. So this one, if you looked at it a little closer, you would see that this actually um, creates a process called Firefox that's actually not Firefox. Um, but this allows you to see that interaction and kind of trace back a little easier what sort of processes it's creating and things like that, the different changes that the, the virus is making. Um, another thing you can do is you can, right from here, do things like dump the, the, um, dump the memory. Um, you can ping virus total right from here. So if you see a process and you're like, I don't remember this one, you can run it through virus total right from here. Um, you can also compare strings through this program. So if you know what the real one looks like and you know what the suspicious ones looks like, you can run strings right in here and look at, okay, here are the strings from the one I know is good, here are the strings from the one I suspect is different. Um, so it's a really pretty cool program. I'll hop out of here again and go back to my slides. Uh, so run Process Explorer, we just did that. Uh, Redshot is the next one. Um, I'll just show you the tool real fast. I think I'm actually almost at the end of my slide, so I'll try to keep going. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Okay. All right, so... 7-zip, extract, infected. Grab the right one. Uh, red shot, okay. So it comes in a lot of different options. I recommend just doing the Unicode for whatever you have 64 x 86, um, depending on what you're running for your VM. Um, but it's really, really easy. So first shot, you just take a shot right there. You can see on the bottom, as soon as that stops changing, then you know that it's done taking its registry shot. All right, there it stopped. So then you run your virus. And then this is another good one where it's kind of good to, to wait just a little while. Um, we'll wait just a, a second here. And then you do your second snapshot. All right, so there it's done. And then it's got this really fun compare button that pops up. And this will give you a nice good summary of basically everything that changed in the system registry. Uh, maybe, it's thinking about it. There we are. So we can see at the top that added three keys to the registry. Um, it added eight values. It made five modifications. And that's, I'm not saying that the virus itself did, but something between when you started it and when, when you stopped it made changes. So some of these might just be noise. Um, others are probably gonna actually be the, the virus you're talking about. Um, yes, yeah, so that is basically the gist of the dynamic analysis stuff. Um, the next thing I was gonna show you is Ida Pro. Um, I'll just really, really quick, because I actually took some snapshots just in case this happened. Um, so for Ida Pro, basically what you do is you run the program through it, and it says, you know, here's this raw assembly language. Um, it also identifies things like names of different things. Um, so what I try to recommend is if you can, and the names don't always show up, it just kind of depends on, on the program and how it was coded and whether it's being called by the ordinal number or the name itself. Um, but so what I recommend is you find the names, and you can do a cross-reference to the names and jump to that spot in the code and then uh, Ida Pro lets you rename stuff inside there. So as you're working, you can say, okay, so I'm looking at this section of code here. Um, this is closing the clipboard, so I can rename it 
um, as I see fit. Um, so this section here, I looked at and I said, okay, well this is very clearly reading from a clipboard. Um, and then from there, you start to identify what the different subroutines are. Subroutines are essentially basically like functions in you know, C++, different things like that. So you start going through and you start renaming um, to something that's meaningful for you. So in this case, it started a new process. That part I was pretty sure it was doing the key logger. Um, it calls the network hook, it reads from the clipboard, closes the clipboard. Um, basically through that process, you're gonna try to start to reverse engineer what the code itself is doing. Um, yeah, so in a nutshell, that's it. <laughs> Any quick questions? Do we have time for questions? Probably not. <laughs> All right, cool.